I'd like to share the story with you. The story we built up based on the request of our customer. And the story we built up because we don't want to ask or we don't want to lost the train, the train of test automation or the, the things on the market which are going on. And that's why we build it up. And I'll now need to switch to English a bit, my, my mind, so it, it'll take uh, maybe 15 more minutes, 15 more seconds. So, uh, so I find out that this might be also interesting for all of you, because I believe the IT is changing rapidly, and we need to adapt. All IT is adapting new challenges, and we need to adapt as well as the testers. And this is useful for us as a company and probably also for you as an individual working in IT. So uh, the topic I chose for today is test automation and trends in, in test automation. Let me introduce quickly, who don't know me, I'm Marcel Veselka. I found uh, Tessena with uh, one English guy in 2013 uh, and since then I am trying to help companies to improve how they do the testing and also trying to develop the market. A lot of changes are there and I, hopefully, I hope that we contribute to that as well. I like skiing, especially in Italy, now it's popular. You might notice a lot of news out there and I also like running. I made or not made a mistake. I, I came to the Prague 10 years ago, but the mistake was I forgot to return back to Slovakia. Since then, I'm still here, living here with my wife and two children. And probably that's it for about me. Uh, I'm very enthusiastic uh, about testing. So uh, what I'll to, uh, talk about is testing and test automation. I, I'm not sure whether I'm on the right position. Everything is okay, recording. So that's me. And now let's uh, focus on the topics what I would like to share with you. As I already mentioned, I would like to share with you some uh, thing about testing, changes in the testing, and also changes in the test automation itself. So uh, I start from the really top level. And first, when I prepared the, the slides for my, our customers, I try to understand what's going on in the market within the IT. So I went out and find some reports. The reports, of course, where you go when you're searching for some reports and surveys and data and some analytics and some predictions, you go out there for the Gartner report. So I went there and I find out that companies last year spent 3.7 trillion US dollars in IT. 3.7 trillions. You know how much money is it? I don't. I can't imagine what the number mean. I, I can't understand how much money is it. So I was thinking about how we could easily interpret the number. So I said, okay, what are the, our budgets like in Czech Republic? How much we spend in Czech Republic? How much we spend in Slovakia? And I took the third one, Austria, because these are the market where we operate. And I was trying to calculate how much money we spend or how quickly we need to spend within these countries to get rid of all the money which were spent in 2019 in IT. And this is what I found out. In Slovakia, Slovakia could live out of the money 85 years. 85 years. One generation could live out of the money. What we spend in IT. For Czech Republic is a bit less. And for Austria, less as expected, maybe. But this is one generation could live out of the money in IT. But why I'm talking about it? Why these numbers might be interesting? There is other fact coming out from the survey. Companies are changing where they focus, where they invest. They are moving from hardware investments into software. Now, IT is software. Software is IT. There is no hardware. There is, of course. But the number of money people spend on hardware 
are smaller and smaller. Uh, and one more topic regarding the expenditures and trends in IT. This is a slide I grabbed from the presentation uh, from Tessena Fest we host last week in Vienna. This guy was talking about completely something else about security uh, and inbuilt security testing in uh, DevOps. But these are the numbers already four or five years old. How much deployment companies do within one day or one month. So this is the frequency, how often companies deploy into production. And these are not the new numbers, this is four years old already. This, this was happening four years ago. So some enterprises improved. Some banks already deliver their software once a month. Maybe some banks are doing it even quicker. But this cadence, this speed, this pace, this is something we need to adapt. So how we could adapt if the change, the, the IT is changing so rapidly? What do we need to do in software testing? What is the impact of these changes in IT into testing? Before I will go into detail of test automation, I was questioning myself what we need to really change in, uh, in testing. And I explore a lot of colleagues, I explore a lot of uh, other customers, finding out what's going on there. And I also went out and read more than 20 plus articles about changes in testing. There are many guys out there selling something to you, but some answers keep coming again and again. It's keep repeating. So. These are my four trends in testing I find out which will impact test automation at the end. First one is expectation and responsibility split. Companies are not talking about testers anymore. They do talk about testing. How this will impact us. There are no test analysts, test managers, testers. There is a testing. And we are there, out there, to help them with testing. Because testing and quality assurance becoming all team responsibility. This is not testers job only anymore. We are part of the bigger game. We need to help other team members to improve quality. And the other thing coming out there the skills need to be changed. We need to change as a testers because there is a big demand and we need to react on the things which are going on out there. And you might find a lot of companies now are talking about security, user experience, low testing, and all the other stuff we never did before. And now it's a part of our sprints. It's part of our delivery every day. This is not some external companies coming in and doing the performance testing for us two days before we will go live. Of course, there are such services and such companies, but more and more we are integrating these activities as a part of our sprints. What else is going on? A lot of companies are trying to change their organization. You might hear a lot of about DevOps and Agile and all these transformation. It still keeps going. Companies are transforming and we need to adapt. You might also have heard about something like continuous testing, shift right and shift left approach. We do a lot of changes in, in the processes and ways how we behave within the, within the companies and within the teams building products. Apart from that, there are many tools popping up. Many open source tools are founded almost every day. And why I'm talking about that? Because it's important to think about how will impact this us. It's not anymore learn one tool and earn from that for next five, 10 years. The market is changing. A lot of new tools 
which one I should focus on, how I should cope with it on one side. On the other side, the big players are trying to eat up the small startups with some potentials because they are trying to proper, uh, offer them end-to-end -end solutions. They are trying to offer them from the beginning until end one single solution. And I brought a few examples. One, which I didn't put on the slide, you might note Atlassian, the company offering Jira, Bamboo, or Confluence. These are the tools. Uh, I would expect that's it, what they have, nothing else. But they spent one billion US dollars in their acquisitions, and they acquired more than 20 companies already. Could you imagine that, how the market is moving? And it's not outside the testing, it's within the testing as well. I took just two, you might know, one is Tricentis, named as a bigger or best automation tool vendor by Gartner, or Smart Bear, well, uh, Smart Bear well known uh, because of SOAP UI. They are eating the smaller players to offer end-to-end -end solutions, and they are trying to be bigger and bigger. So this is what's going on on the market. And then, of course, there are a lot of ideas like not evolution, like revolutionary ideas. Jennifer will talk uh, soon about AI and machine learning. This is one thing, once it'll happen, and there are some predictions that it'll happen this year, it'll completely change how we deal with the testing. The other topic there is RPA. It's basically test automation in production and a lot of other ideas. I call them buzzwords. And I didn't take, uh, I, didn't go, I didn't go too much into detail in my preparation because I am not sure whether this will survive. Some ideas, even on my slides I, where, where I go into more details, might not be the right one. They might die as we go, but these are the trends. This is where the market is going. And this, it's important to understand what's going on out there because this might also impact your daily job as well. So summing it up, summing it up these are the four my trends. You might have a different one because if you go out, there is a lot of discussion about it. And this is what I saw as a keep repeating or interesting and where I believe that there might be some potential in the future and these ideas might survive and win over the others. So this is my four. But if you simplify, what are these ideas about? Everyone is trying to search the way to make it cheaper, quicker, and better. And I feel that this is exactly where the test automation could help. Because test automation is trying to target all these challenges and help us to improve what we do. So that's why I built the test automation trends, or trends in test automation. And again, I was lucky enough to find, uh, okay, I'll, I'll come to that, fa uh, find four areas. But before that, if you go out and look on the numbers before we will go the, to the actual trends, I would like to share some numbers with you. If you go out to the ISTQB, it's pretty old, it's two, two years old. They are saying test automation will be the trendy topic. If you go there again, there is some new report. They are saying not test automation anymore, test automation plus AI and machine learning. So it's changing and we will come to that uh, soon. If you go to some other report, I'll just quickly skip this one. These are the areas where you could focus your automation because they, probably there will be ma most efficient areas. If you go to some other report from Google, for example, they are saying if you find the, the DevOps team which m meet some certain criteria, they call them elite teams, they do only 10% uh, of that testing activities manually, but not in future. Now, it's, I think it, the report is two years old. So this is something which is going on on the market, and I didn't like it. When I saw it first time, I said, this needs to be some stupid idea. What are you trying to sell me? 10% manually? No. 
it's impossible. So what I did, I, I was trying to dig into data more and more and searching for some more data. So I have a few more data and then I promise I will go into the, the content of, of, test of trends of test automation. So what are the other data? Some other report. In next five years, automation will more than double. Then I was going out again and trying to find some more data. And I find out that if the automation will double in, uh, in four, five years, then uh, I would like to compare with the overall investment in, uh, in testing. And I find out that probably if the predictions are right, in 2024 there will be more automation than manual testing. This, these are some predi prediction might be wrong, but I would guess that at least the direction is right because we are talking here about the trends. Some people might ask me when it will happen. I don't know. These are the trends. This is the direction where the market is moving. It might happen in next year. It might never happen because it will die as we go. But these are the trends. So if this is true, I was still not happy with the numbers, so I go one more deep, uh, deep dive. And I took some other report from KPMG. You might know the company uh, dealing with some executive uh, advisory and uh, executive uh, management advices. And, and they re uh, issued this report. I don't know, it might be also one or two years old. And if you take the extremes, 5% of companies saying we don't do automation at all. And the other extreme is, it's about 18%. They are saying we do more than 75% of automation. This is one quarter of the overall audience which was asked or the companies which was asked. And there, there, there are three more quarters and each is, I would say, equally spread or equally uh, big. So these are the numbers. But let's skip the numbers and now going to the, the trends. What's going on? What, where the companies will invest if they will invest as the predictions are saying? First one, I call them all the ideas are coming back. Second one, execution and maintenance assistance. Companies are not discussing anymore whether this is worth to automate or not, or where to start, or which tool to use. But how to keep up with the size of the automation they are doing, how to maintain them, and how to scale up. This is the second trend or second challenge companies are dealing with. The other one, or the third one, is AI and machine learning. Jennifer will talk more about it. And then the, I call it other bus. This is basically the list of the, all the other ideas where I feel there might be some potential and a huge impact on the market. So all the ideas are coming back. This is one topic or first topic I chose. And this is pretty old picture. I was testing the picture last week several times, asking people whether they know it. And I find out that they don't. This is five years old picture already. And this is how Android world is developing, how it's changing. There are two things to understand from the picture. One is crazily big and fragmented. And the other one is it's rapidly changing. How we could keep up with this? How we could react on that change and on that amount of configuration out there? And the answer is not automate. You need to be good test analyst before you will start with automation. But first, you need to do the proper analysis and find out what to automate or what to te even test, whatever approach you will choose. And once this is done, you might start with the automation. So what I see as a one of the trend, companies will heavily invest into simulators, into solutions which might help you to build it up in a way that you can easily automate. And now I'll try to explain and maybe a bit excuse the slide because it's really horrible. But you might see the left and right side. On the right side, I hope on your side, yeah. On the right side, there are already pre-built solutions for mobile and web apps. It's out of the box. You just integrate it into your Selenium scripts or whatever scripts you have and use them. On the left side, 
there are the parts you might use to build up your all, uh, whole own uh, tool stack. It's on the left side. And we, we know the Czechs and Slovaks are like the, sorry for switching to the Czech or Slovak now. We are like a so radit postavíme sami. So whoever would like to build it up by themselves, then you might use your own components and build it up. Or you might go to the right direction and use it as well. Of course, it's not for everything, but at least for mobile and, uh, and web uh, test automation, the right tool might be the right one for you. I put there one extra thing I'll skip, and it's not a bug in slide. GraphQL shouldn't be there at all. But I thought that maybe this is also something you might be interested. It might support your mobile development because it's more robust when you develop your mobile apps or you're providing your APIs to the third parties. If you are interested into that, it was uh, published by Facebook. I think it's uh, now growing. So this is one topic which might be very close to the mobile development and providing the third party APIs. It shouldn't be on the slide, but I didn't have any place to put it, so I put it here. So it's not back. I did it intentionally. So record and plague is coming back. I don't know whether you noticed in 2018, the guys, I think from Apple Tools, rebuilt the, the recorder. And people, when I'm talking about that, always laughing or looking at me, yeah, yeah, you are the crazy guy, record and play. We heard a lot about that. It, it, it can't come back. But they are actually features which might be interesting for you. And we saw some customers, they could survive with this kind of automation, not heavily scaled across the organization. But for some simple cases, this might be good enough for some particular cases. The other example is more a commercial tool. It's called Parasoft Selenic. You might heard about. And this is something very similar. You have your Java Selenium tests already built up. And they prepare something like Eclipse plugin. So you just record and play, and it feeds all the Java code into your existing project. It just feeds all the code there. It follows all the page object patterns. It follows all the right structure, and so on. I don't know whether they will survive. I saw, saw some demo. We will see how it will work uh, in scale. But this is one of the, one of the examples where the guys are still trying to not give up and find a way to offer record and play. The other topic, like the old new world fight, there are guys coming out and saying, ah, you know what, selenium. This, these are the old guys. It can't survive anymore. You should take some cooler stuff like Cypress or Nightwatch or something else. I personally don't believe that somebody could beat Selenium. But this is one of the trends. People are starting questioning whether Selenium could survive even further. Remember my trend in testing number three? Big players are eating small one. Tools are popping up and disappear. Selenium is still there. Jennifer was talking today about Appium, that they are here since 2011. So Selenium, I don't know, maybe a few years uh, before. 20 years old. 20? No. Yeah. OK, the task for the, for the break, if you could Google it when they found the Selenium, I would, I would be really wonder. But there are a lot of discussion whether Selenium era is over or not. So these are the old things keep discussing and trying to develop. Execution and maintenance. You, OK, I, I put there just three, which are basically two. It depends how you structure them. But first one is uh, intelli intelligent exe test execution. Intelligent ex test execution is the approach to reduce speed and be more par uh, targeted in your mm -hmm. testing. I was trying to draw some picture which might be self-explanatory, but I'll try to explain. When I was starting with this automation, we did a lot of like executed by double click on your desktop. 
Then, when, then once we were get bored out of it, we try to schedule it. And then we integrate it into some CI, CD. So this was our journey in triggers in test execution. On the other hand, there was some scope selection. And the, the first challenge when you scale your automation, it takes too long. It's too slow. You don't want to bother so many past. You are interested on, only on a failed test because you really want to fix them. So then you need to select the scope. And the first one was if the full scope wouldn't work, we select them manually by tagging the tests, by tagging and saying, OK, this is the smoke test, or this is the module test, or this is particular test set for this particular module. And then we, the next stage is dynamically select. Once you push your code, or your developers push your code, or their code, into Git or any other repository, the tests are selected automatically. Because the tool selects which tests are touched or which function is touched to execute the relevant tests. And this is, this is it. This is what the companies are trying to implement and call it test execution intelligence or intelligent test execution. These are trends. The, I didn't find any tool which could cover both uh, uh, axes, but this is what companies are now trying to work on to speed it up and be more targeted. Self-healing is the other approach. Self-healing is the approach when, when the tests are trying to fix them themselves as they go, as, as they are executed. I try to describe four levels of self-healing maturity or levels of, uh, uh, of, of the self-healing test. And I'll, I, I won't go too much into details. I'll try to just explain very quickly. First stage is pretty stupid and simple and is implemented in Selenium IDE. Instead of one, having one locator, you have four or three or two or five, it depends how much the recorder could, uh, how much the recorder could uh, record from the tests. So you just getting the, 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 these selectors, and when it fails, it tries the other one, and when it fails, it tries the other one, and so on. And it's a stupid idea because the maintenance is anyhow difficult. It might help you a bit in test execution. That's why the AI and machine learning come into play. And instead of record and play all these strange locators, you rather do it visually. Or you might have, and I think uh, Pingline colleagues will also show that uh, Jeremy stuff. Yes. So mm -hmm. you might record or save the whole DOM, like the object of the page, and try to find the other way to do it, but it's dynamic. It's not like I remember just three, do these three or these two. So these are the uh, second stage or the second level of maturity in self-healing. And then once you have this, so you can dynamically locate the, the position or the, your elements, you might go even further and advance your reports, your analytics, to help you identify whether these failures or these warnings are relevant one and how to cope with them. You might need to know whether this is an application failure or it's your script failure and so on. And once you have this analytics, you go even further and you let the machine fix the code. So you, use, you would say, okay, if you have 80% confidence, just fix the Java code for me. I don't wanna bother with that. So this is the self-healing. Company, companies are heavily working on it. Somebody might skip the self-healing feature at all by implementing AI and machine learning. But this is the way how some companies are trying to cope with the maintenance because this is the other trouble. So within my second area, this is intelligent test execution and self-healing. So how to maintain and execute the code in an efficient way. The third one is AI and machine learning. AI and machine learning is something which, once it'll mature enough, it'll completely change how we do the things. 
I don't want to spend too much details because I have one uh, PhD graduate of AI and machine learning with me, Jeremy and, and uh, Pink Lion uh, guys who are expert on, on that. So they might tell you more, but basically it's mathematical uh, approach, how to predict instead of hard code and program how the machine should work. So some slides I will skip maybe for the training you use usually n n neural network. Uh, there is a lot of uh, out open source stuff out there from Google. You might do it yourself for several months or you just acquire some tool to do it for you. I'll skip all the things because this is more. Maybe one more. This is some experiment we did in Tessena. We took the open source tools and tried to identify. You might know the website. It's not the biggest one, maybe second one for uh, uh, electronic devices. And we were trying to identify the elements on a page by us using machine uh, learning and skipping the locators. And you might see that we were able to identify login or logo. And this is the number of confidence the, the model says it's probably the login. Uh, we did it, of course, with our favorite tool, Robot Framework. So we uh, wrapped the, the keywords. Actually, it was written in Python, but we wrapped it into keywords so we could easily use it uh, with our pro projects on customer side, and uh, our customers could use it as well. So this is what we did in the area. But it's like, as, as, as I said, it's self-made approach. If you really want to go quickly into the area, there are much better, do, much better tools out there, and you might skip, or we might help you to skip the experiments we did. So, and last one about the AI and machine learning. Uh, actually, Jason Arbon, ex-Googler, Googler, and the guy who wrote uh, how Google uh, test software is part of Ping Lion team. He works with them uh, under test AI. And he wrote some interesting article about how the automation will develop from the manual into almost fully autonomous. Uh, and this is the, so the AI probably in a way how we could see it now, it's not the end stage, it's just some preliminary stage as we will go. And the visionary talk about this one or the article about this one might be found on LinkedIn. It's still there, it's public. You might go for it if, if you are interested. And then this is just uh, one slide I've grabbed from Ping Lion where you could use the AI and machine learning. They will not touch probably all the areas, but these are the topics which very, the AI and machine learning could help you. The last area in test automation is, uh, I call it other bus, because there are many interesting ideas but I don't want to over, overwhelm you. So I took just a few of them and put them as an extra category. And these are the continuous testing, shift left and shift right, chaos engineering, hyper automation, and RPA. So going through, that, going through that very quickly, continuous testing is something when I saw it first time, I thought this needs to be some marketing pitch. I don't believe that this is, this is something which anyhow could help us. But if you deep dive into the topics, you might find a lot of interesting ideas. Nowadays, there are many tools. We are not still using enough, but it'll grow, which might scan our code before we will touch the app or system or API or whatever. So before that, we could have some scanners help us to find out all the quality issues, like smells in code, like security vulnerabilities, and all these other things. Then, uh, of course, there'll need to be some test automation in it, like a classical one you might know, like API and UI testing. And then, of course, some exploratory testing. It depends which approach you choose. It might be continuous delivery, where you skip the manual testing and leave it for later, or you do the uh, continuous, uh, what, what I said, continuous delivery when you, you want to go directly into production or you might have it as a part of your pipeline, this manual testing. 
Uh, and then the last one, if we are good in automation, but not in test automation, in automation in general within the company, we are using the right tool, we might be a bit braver in deploying into production. So you might use, and I know we are now on the ground of, uh, we, we are hosted by Avast, and I think they are using some similar approach to uh, deliver some features into some specific regions. At least they did it a few years ago when I saw their presentation. So you might select like, for example, I'll do it only for Brno to check whether it, te uh, to test whether it, it works. And if it works, I'll scale these features across country, region, continent, and then globe before I will go out with a big bang or, or full scale solution. And the other thing, uh, of course, it needs to be supported by some monitoring and deployment tools, which might easily and quickly uh, react in case of any fire. So we could easily fire fight once it's happened. Cars engineering, is, is, this is some other trend. Uh, somebody would say, why are you talking now about this one? Uh, it was invented uh, several years ago. It's actually, I don't know, eight or nine year old, old concept which was used by Netflix. Because by introducing the modern microservices architecture, you need to also handle it, the issues or quality uh, parameters uh, like rob robustness or performance or stability and all these things. So the guy said, okay, if we have these scalable microservices, let's try to remove the database, what will happen? Or let's try to kill, kill this server, what will happen? And there are more than 20 tools already out there which you could easily use to implement this as a one of the, your practice because all the others, this might be the, the la, maybe the last exciting stuff uh, trying to break your infrastructure because you will have a lot of stuff already automated. This is semi-automated. You need to work on that uh, to uh, spin it off, but then uh, it works automatically as well. Uh, so this, uh, the, the chaos engineering is one of the topic. I think the, one of the uh, tool people are using is Chaos Monkey, uh, founded by Netflix. It's completely free. You can try and play with that one. The other one is hyper automation. I'll just maybe skip this, but the, the key message is automation is uh, having more and more added value when you do all the things automation, not only testing, all your deployment and all the things you could automate within the SDLC, your life cycle, uh, it's becoming more and more valuable than for you. Then RPA, actually I don't consider this as a testing, but to have the, all the buzzwords, all the things out there, if somebody failed in system integration, and or system design, then the, then the business trying to survive by implementing something they call RPA. But the RPA is actually test automation in production. I saw some uh, breveries uh, trying to uh, show the cases how they replace three account accountants by the tool which read the emails and post all these payments, all the invoices into SAP. But if you really need this, why you don't design your system in a way that it'll do automatically? Why you are introducing test automation tools in production to, to cope with these kind of issues? And if you would be interested in that, because some people say, go there, there is, now this is more sexy stuff, they, pay, they will pay you more, then I put a few, a few tools you might use for that. One is Robot Framework. They are, they founded, I think, a small non-profit organization supported by 20 plus companies uh, trying to adjust the tool to be RPA ready. Then is, there is Blue Prism and UiPath, which are the big players, which are coming from uh, RPA uh, world and trying to get to the uh, testing. And then Tricentis RPA Studio, which is basically wrapped uh, Tosca, you might know, it's just rebranded, and maybe they brought some nicer UI, and they are trying to succeed in RPA world as well. So these are the 
the tools. If you would like to go into RPA more details, there is a lot of uh, stuff out there. I think Test Tosca is also providing some free certification for RPA, so if you would be interested, uh, you might go there and have some certificates. We also partnering with them because we believe these are the big guys out there on the market, so this might help us also to be efficient when we uh, delivering some other services to our customers. So this is not only one tool, but one of the tools we are using. So uh, these were my four trends. And why I was talking about these four trends? Because I believe with this pace, with this speed in IT, if we are not able to keep up, if we are not able to understand what's going on and out there, somebody else will do. So I believe whatever you are running the company or you are working for some team, if you want to succeed, you should watch out because there is a lot going on out there. And these are the things I believe have some potential and might impact what we do and how we do that. So these are my four outcomes from my research or from my, from my studying the market exercise. So that's it from me. I hope I'm not overrunning too much. And I would like to thank you all for coming. I hope you found some ideas you never heard before. If you do, come to me as, uh, and we could talk because you are the guy I would like to follow. Because you, you probably know something more I should learn. So thank you very much. And this is not over yet. I would like to uh, have some game with you. And I would like to play something with you before I will disappear. We are organizing two more interesting mini conferences or micro conferences. One is actually in Brno. We lost the keynote speaker last week. So that's why I put just some pictures over there. We will need to search for a new keynote. But for the Prague, if you don't know this guy, come to me again because this is really like a star in testing. Michael Bolton is coming. Some people are saying, hey, I know, I know, it. this is the singer. This is not the singer. This is, this is guy uh, from the testing world, and you should know him. He will be here in November. And I something bring with me. Because you came today to learn something new. So you probably will be happy to learn even more in November or in May again. So I would like to give you this QR code. And if you scan it, I hope everybody has the app, especially for Android guys, because Apple has it automatically. It's part of the camera. If you could scan it and fill out the form behind the QR code, by probably end of Jennifer's talk, I'll give you one free ticket for Tessena Fest in Brno or Prague. You might choose which one you want. Yeah, beeping. It works. Test it. <laughs> so uh, this is what I, I would like to give away one free ticket for, uh, for, uh, for Tessena Fest. And there, are, there is only one rule. I will decide who will have it. I will probably randomly choose. But <laughs> yeah, I'll randomly choose, not probably. I'll randomly choose one of you who could join us and learn something more in Brno or in uh, Prague, in May or in November. So now that's it. That's really it from me. And thank you again.